Um, welcome everybody. Good to be back after a two week uh, vacation of sorts. Um, yeah, we're gonna have uh, winter twigs, I think next week by Chris. So a little bit of change there. Check out your winter twig ID. So uh, yeah, it's about what, six below, I think here, it's supposed to get down to 18 below. This is definitely the way to do this tonight because I would not want to be driving out anywhere. I don't think to do to, to, to go to a workshop tonight. So everyone's uh, safe and sound, warm at home. So, all right, we're gonna take a look at uh, mints as you can see tonight. Uh, so the mints is um, of course a very important group, pretty recognizable group. I think, you know, most of us can probably recognize a mint or you can, um, you know, smell that it's a mint perhaps before you even see it. So as a group, they're pretty, pretty easy to recognize to the family level. There's about, um, well, the, Angiosperm phylogeny working group uh, says there's about 236 genera in the Lamiaceae and over 7,000 species. In Iowa, Eilers and Rosa list um, 24 genera and 53 species. However, if you uh, have Eilers and Rosa, you might check that and just make a note in there. They include Physostegia parviflora. Uh, as a species in Iowa, and that's not correct. Physostegia parviflora is, does not occur in Iowa. Its inclusion in Iowa's and Rosa earlier was based on several misidentified vouchers. So, um, and I, I, I checked real quick, 17 then of the 52 species uh, of mints in Iowa, 17 of them are non-native. That's about 33%. That's a little bit higher than the average of the Iowa flora. Um, and we're just looking at native ones tonight. And uh, I pulled out about 12 genera to take a look at and 27 species. So it's a big group. This is probably more species than um, we've looked at in any of the workshops yet. So we'll have to kind of um, uh, speed our way through it, I guess you might say. Um, but it's a, it's a similar format. We'll, we'll take a look at some basic characteristics of mints and then we'll take a look at the tables that I sent you and then kind of go through a, a pictorial key. So with that, oh, and then we're going to take a look at one video uh, in, in, in between there, a short one. So let's, yeah, let's start here with some characteristics of the mints. This is a nice diagram that comes from um, vascular plant taxonomy. It's a textbook I use for field botany. And a lot of these things you're going to be familiar with. So obviously the square stems, opposite simple leaves, all mints have opposite simple leaves and, and pretty much square stems, although you'll see in the table I put together, sometimes we can describe them as very strongly square stem or more weakly square stem, depending upon just how, how um, uh, rigid those, those angles are. Here's a um, characteristic of the flowers, of course. So the corollas, remember the corollas are the petals the collection of petals, the term that re represents all of the petals. And the term zygomorphic is a term, we'll take a look at the plant glossary, which I've added some things to a little bit later, but zygomorphic means that the flowers, the petals in this case are bilaterally symmetrical. Um, that means again, of course, there's just one plane of division that can be uh, placed in there to separate the flowers into two halves. And they're also, most of the time, uh, two-lipped, bilabiate is the term that we use for that, it means the same thing. And of course, uh, the old name for Lamiaceae is la the labiate, which was in reference to that. The two lips um, are formed by the corolla lobes. So in general, you'll see two of the corolla lobes form the upper lip and three of the corolla lobes form the lower lip. And we'll see uh, in another diagram in just a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about pollination real quick when we get to that one. The calyx shown there right below that little, um, the, the terms I just brought up there. Again, remember the calyx are the collection of sepals, this, the much smaller leaf-like bracts that sit below the petals. And in um, the Lamiaceae, they can be either actinomorphic which is another term that refers to symmetry, but now this, this time it means that 
it has a radial sym symmetry. In other words, the, there's a center point and the parts uh, radiate out from that. That means again, that there can be several places where you could uh, put a line of division across there and, and, and cut the calyx into two mirror halves. Or they can be zygomorphic too. Oops, and I just misspelled zygomorphic, sorry there. We'll see that, that that's one of the characteristics that helps to separate them somewhat. The primary inflorescence, remember that is a term we've, we've had before. That's the inflorescence or that's the arrangement of flowers, um, a term that's used to describe how those actual flowers are arranged. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna assume that there's, you know, a lot of you have been on the workshop, on these workshops before, and you know some of these things, but I'm gonna have to assume, I think, that some of you may not have been. So um, kind of review some of that. So uh, in the mints, the most common type of inflorescence is something we call a vertisol. A vertisol is a whorl. A whorl means more than three. We use the term whorl to describe leaves often. Whenever there's three or more leaves attached at the same node, it's the same idea here, uh, except there's usually a lot more flowers. Uh, there can be, you know, eight, 10, 12, even more in some cases, but a whorl of flowers that are attached at the same node. And they, in a sense then, because they're attached at the same node, they're all sitting in the axles of the two opposite leaves at that node. So axillary vertices is another way of describing that. Uh, this is something you won't see unless you really dig into the flower and look real close and sort of dissect the flower out. But this is the characteristic of, of the uh, family as well. This term is uh, gynobasic style. And you can see it's pretty well diagrammed here. What it means is that the, the style appears to be attached to the base of the ovary or even maybe the receptacle rather than uh, where they're normally attached, which would be the top of the ovary. And, and quite often it does kind of look something like this. Basically the ovary kind of has these lobes on them and the style goes down between those lobes. So there's actually four of them. The four lobes of the ovary represent the places where there, there's, a, there's an ovule in each of those lobes. And an ovule, if you remember, an ovule is what becomes a seed. So when we look at uh, the fruits, and we can see the fruits here inside this calyx, um, what we have is four nutlets, each of the ovules that were in each of one, each and each of the four lobes of the ov ovary, each of those ovules, if everything goes according to plan, each of those ovules will become a seed. And the seed is contained within the fruit called a nutlet. A nut is just a really, really tiny nut, basically, and it's a nut is a type of dry, indehiscent fruit that uh, usually just has one seed in, in inside of it. There's another more fancy name for this. We'll we'll get to a little bit later. Here's another picture of what those uh, what that ovary looks like. The four lobes. This is called a floral diagram, and it's a way to visualize and characterize the char the characteristics of of a flower for a fa family. Um, the center part here does represent the ovary and these little circles here represent the ovules. Uh, this black arrow points to the sepals and the fact that they're joined together by these lines means they're usually fused together as we see here. And the purple or pink arrow points to the petals and they too are joined by these lines, which means they also are, are fused together. So again, both the uh, calyx and the corolla are, are fused. These little lollipop diagrams here represent the stamens. And in the uh, Lamiaceae, there's either four or two stamens. That would be something that separates them into different species. And uh, always epipetalous. And that's a term that means that the stamens are attached to or fused to by their filaments, the bottom of them, the bottom of the filaments are fused to the corolla, inside the corolla tube. So down inside here, these stamens are, are fused to the side of the, of the petals. 
All right, I think. Oh, and aromatic oils, of course. Um, almost, almost all the mints, certainly a, a large number of them, many species of the mints possess high quality essential oils, uh, typically in all of the above ground parts. They're especially uh, abundant in the leaves and flowers. And these are probably most uh, useful, ecologically speaking, as a deterrent against insects. I have a paper here uh, published um, in Molecules. It's entitled Essential Oils Extracted from Different Species of the Lamiaceae Plant Family as Prospective Bioagents Against Several Detrimental Pests. And they include a long table of many genera in the family and uh, point out uh, proven uh, through, uh, through science uh, effects of the essential oils in these plants and what, what kind of effects they have. For example, just point out one real quick here. Mentha is a mint that maybe you all know. It's shown that the essential oils there have a toxicity on adult females of an aphid and have larvicidal activity against um, mosquitoes. So again, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty extensive. All right, then, whoops. One thing I want to point out right here before I go is that here we see four stamens, here we see two stamens. So this is a situation in salvia, um, a genus in, in the family where there's just two stamens. And these purple things here are called the connectives. And what's happening here is that basically it's, it's here's the filament and the um, one of the anthers is fertile and will produce pollen, this one right here with a circle, and one of the anthers is sterile and it does not produce any pollen. They are connected by this connective or a filament. And I'll, I'll point this out now because we're going to see a little video. In, in salvia, these are really important as a mechanism involved in pollination. All right, now we can move on to just a few pictures here of some uh, examples. So one of the things that comes up is whether the stamens are exerted or not. So in this flower right here, the stamens are not exerted because the stamens do not come out of the upper lip. The stamens right here are completely contained within the, and, and covered up, if you will, by the upper lip. If they were exerted, you would see them. You would see the ends of the stamens you know, sticking out here ways. So that's an important character. Another one are, is whether the um, upper and lower lips, are they, are they lobed? And again, they are formed of lobes of the corolla, but are those lobes still intact? Most often, um, you'll see again the table I put together, most of the time the lower lip does have three lobes still recognizable, uh, but sometimes the upper lip, um, you can't see the two lobes, it's just basically one. Sometimes the, the uh, inflorescences are more of a raceme, uh, a terminal raceme uh, at the top of the plant, as opposed to those axillary verticels. And uh, again, we'll look at the um, glossary, but a raceme is what you see right here. It's an axis, the central axis of the inflorescence here, the rachis, and the flowers are attached to that by pedicels little uh, flower stems. The stamens always ascend under the upper lip. And so they ascend kind of falling just underneath the upper lip here. Also the style, you can see the style branch coming out here, the style coming out here and then forking into two branches. And so this is a part of the, me the mechanism for pollination in the mints, the, the lower lip, uh, represents and, and functions as a landing platform for the pollinator. Uh, the insect is going to probe down into the corolla here and look for nectar being produced by nectar glands at the base of the ovary. And in doing so, it's going to rub its back up against these anthers here and collect some pollen. And then if it visits another flower uh, and that flower has already dispersed its pollen, then the, the 
stigma and styles will be out. And so then the style and the stigmas can pick up some pollen. In most of the mints, the, um, the flowers are protandrous, which means that the, 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 the plant is male first. The, the stamens do their thing first, disperse pollen, and then they wither away. And then the styles elongate and the stigmas become mature and are receptive to pollen. Here's a vertisol of sorts right here again. Uh, so a whole bunch of flowers all coming out of the axles of what appear to be leaves here. These are actually flower bracts, but they're large enough in a sense to, to be a, a leaf, but, but they are colored. And so they are better represented as, as bracts, flower bracts or floral bracts. Yeah, one more diagram I found on, uh, on the internet uh, just to um, kind of fill out this slide. Again, it's most of the things we've already talked about. You can see the vertisols here really good. These are good examples here of the vertisols. But again, you can see some um, men have more of a terminal or a seam or maybe even a spike. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, basically, what's happening here is that another way of looking at this is that these could be vertisols in here but they're just tightly spaced together. Rather than having an inner node that's this long, normally, um, which we would see on probably most of the mints, the inner nodes become very, very short and these vertices are mainly then at the very top of the plant. All right, there's the sepals again, united sepals. Here again is the nutlets uh, that represent the fruits. And what happens again here is that the, the technical name for the fruit in the mints is a schizocarp. Here's an example of a schizocarp. These, the calyx, which is something that persists in the mints, is often a very important part of the uh, way that the nutlets are dispersed. So the calyx is something that persists and sometimes even um, covers up those nut, nut, nutlets. <clears throat> Tom, All right, we have a question. Is that yeah, one? Okay. So that previous slide was from Botany in a Day. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and then, that's, I, I believe so. That's why okay. that little um, logo is there. Yep. And what was the? Someone asked, "What was the reference, or the guide that you were referencing in the previous slides?" Yeah. So I mean, where all where most of these diagrams come from? Yeah. That is. Um, Vascular plant taxonomy. Nice, nice book to, as is what going to use for teaching field bot botany. <clears throat> Lots of good diagrams, and it goes through each of the fat families. Okay, we're going to, this is where we take a break now before we go into the uh, key, the pictorial key. And so I'm going to. Uh, Shut that down. Oh, let me just get rid of that. That keeps coming up. Let's get rid of that. All right, and let's pull up this real quick. So this is the um, handout in PDF form, and we don't need to spend any time with these. We've already looked at those, but what I wanted to do is briefly point out, uh, again, if it's, this is your first time, we're gonna go through this pictorial key in a little bit. Uh, what I did, since we're looking at a family this time, you know, in the previous workshops, we were looking at a genus. And so it was a little more confined uh, to just the species in a genus. This time we're looking at a family. And so um, the 12 genera that are in the pictorial key are all represented here in this uh, big table. It's kind of a busy table. But I have, there's no way to try to include a key to these genera and have any hopes of getting through this in an hour. So what I did is just put together this table that again represents the 12 genera that we're going to take a look at. And just you know, in each of these columns that you know describes what the characteristics are for the stems, for the leaf attachment and margins of those leaves, the inflorescence and all down the line. And you'll see that, for example, in in regards to the stem, and I kind of wanted to show this and, and so you can see this for yourself, but when you look at the stem, this doesn't distinguish anything. All of these pretty much say the same thing. There's, there's a little bit of difference in the pubescence, 
but they're either strongly four-angled or weakly to strongly four-angled. Lots of them are either glabrous or pubescent. Um, a few uh, exceptions there would be physostegia, which is glabrous only, idioma, which is pubescent on only. Um, but you can see again, variation in amount of hairiness on those stems. In terms of the leaf attachment, there's some variation there. They're either petiolate, of course, they have a petiole or they're a sessile or they might be either of those. Again, you could have, again, within the genus, you could have spe some species that are sessile and some species that have petioles. And there's a lot of variation in the, in the leaf margin too, whether the leaf margin is entire or whether it has teeth. Serrate means it has little teeth, of course. And if you remember, uh, serrulate right here means it has teeth, but they're just really, really small teeth, really, really fine, small teeth. Where you start getting some separation really is in these five characteristics, or these four characteristics here, in the type of inflorescence, some particulars about the calyx, whether it's zygomorphic or tenomorphic, whether it's two-lipped or if it's got just five lobes, uh, the crolla, whether the stamens have are, are four and exerted or not exerted, we know whether they're two or four, and so these are all characteristics. And then this last column. Um, are what I call diagnostic. And what I'm doing here is just basically pointing out which of these columns, for the most part, gives you the most diagnostic characteristic to sort of characterize that genus. And so for Agastache, it says your, the stamens is an important feature that helps separate them, and the inflorescence type here, that it's a terminal dense spike. So you have this table uh, and that's all I'm gonna say about it because you know, we don't have time to, to go through that in any more detail. Then you have the reference table, which I have done for you know, all of the uh, workshops, which again, in most cases is a reference table for a genus, but now it's for this family. And it's gonna include in these 12 genera and 27 species that are represented here in the um, pictorial key. And again, I can't you know, go into detail on all of these, but let me just orient you again, what you're gonna see here, the um, first column here would give you the taxonomy and nomenclature according to flora of North America. But there's nothing here because the flora of North America is not yet done and published for the Lamiaceae. So I don't know what the uh, scientific name is going to be for sure. So that's why nothing was put here. I think in most cases, I, you, you, you are able to, I am able to go and look at for North America and see what kind of is in plan, what's being planned for Lamiaceae, what genera are going to be included in the, in the family. And it looks like uh, not too many changes will occur. So I think probably most of these species names that you see here in Eilers and Rosa will probably be the same species names are gonna be used in the floor of North America when it comes out. Then you've got a column that gives a pretty good description of habitat. And these come usually from, from two or three sources at least. So I try to get sort of a more of a consensus from, from Iowa, from Illinois and Missouri, uh, for example, uh, what the habitat is. Then you got your maps. And again, here I'm giving you the Iowa biogeography with a dot map uh, in the counties. And also then the larger scale, you know, whole country scale. So you can, get, can see where that species is relative to Iowa. For example, Agastache funiculum um, is a Northern species. You know, it's to the North of us. And we, it is uh, an endangered species. It's the only mint that is on the Iowa list of endangered and, spe and, endangered and threatened species. So this map comes from the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory Database. Um, I know uh, Bonap shows there's some, there's some uh, vouchers or there's uh, supposed records over here in Northwest Iowa. You can kind of barely see them there, but there's some yellow uh, dots right in through there. Uh, I don't know what those are for sure. Uh, again, Bonap comes up with um, observations that seem to be coming out of thin air sometimes. So, you know, again, you have to kind of take bone apps distributions um, with a little concern. Uh, but again, most of the time they're probably pretty good. So here's the three Agastaches. There are just three Agastaches in Iowa and I'm including all three of them here. Oh, I need to correct um, a statement. So Blaphilia, there are two Blaphilias and one of them is also endangered or threatened in Iowa. 
Clophilia ciliata. I didn't include that one in the table. I just included the, the wood mint, which is uh, more, more common. And, and again, if you haven't um, had a workshop or been in a workshop, again, what, so this is telling what the status, the Iowa status is. Um, these are either gonna be some threatened or endangered status or native. The Iowa Coalition of Conservatism is a number that, um, uh, well, we're gonna talk more about this, the very last workshop, but it's a number that reflects the fidelity that these species have towards very high quality, pristine natural systems. And uh, it gives you two numbers because the first one is sort of the original one that came out in 2000, the original list, the original rating, if you will. And the second one is the revised uh, coefficient that just come out here in 2020. Most of these maps here you can see again are just representations of the bone app, just blown up to you know the scale of Iowa so you can see things better. When um, it's clear that the distribution in Iowa uh, does not encompass the entire state, such as these two appear to be doing, then I usually put a red line in that sort of approximates where that boundary is for this species. If you live up in this part of the state, you should not be planting Blephilia hirsuta in any of your, your forest restorations. Oh, and these colors, you don't have these, I guess, I forgot to do this before I put the PDF together, but the, the green shading represents more or less a forest species. The yellow shading represents a grassland or savanna species, and the blue shading represents more or less a wetland species. And speaking of uh, wetland, so here's Manta arvensis. That's the name in Islers and Rosa, but I did, I did make a note here. That's probably going to be, or most certainly is going to be changed to Manta canadensis when Flora of North America comes out, because uh, it's now recognized that this is relatively not a native species. Uh, the one we have is Manta canadensis. Uh, and when you see a map that looks like this, that is a map that comes from the Iowa Prairie Plants book by Paul Christensen and Mark Mueller. So um, this is the distribution according to Paul Christensen's work where he, he used vouchers from the three state herbaria and looked at those that uh, represented collections or observations of these plants. Uh, I believe it was prior to 1960 or so at least. So I think they're really good in terms of being able to give us the probably the best approximation of what the native range uh, was prior to restoration beginning to take place and plants getting moved all over the place. So that's kind of a brief um, quick rundown of uh, what's in this table. So again, I said there's two blephilias. I've got one of them in here. There's two hediomas, the penny royals. I've got one of them again choosing the more common species. There's only, uh, well, there's two menthas, but there's only one that's native. And so that's why that's the only one here. Again, as I said, there's only two Physostegias now. Others and Rosa say there's two, but that's not correct. <clears throat> um, there's only one Tucrium in Iowa. And so that one's represented. There's only three Pycnanthemums in Iowa and got all three of them here. There are four salvias in Iowa, two of them native, two of them not native. This is the most common one, Reflexa. Um, and then there are four lycopus in Iowa. You've got all four of them here. There are three Monardas in Iowa, the two most common ones here. And scutellarias, the skull caps. There are seven of those in Iowa and Iris and Rosa. Seven of them listing in Iris and Rosa, including four of them, four of the most common ones here. And then finally, the last one here is stakies, the hedge nettles. And so this is a little bit different. I'll have to explain this. So Iris and Rosa only lists three stakies, but uh, what I've done here is giving you sort of a head a heads up as to what's probably gonna happen in Florida of North America using the floor of Michigan. So using the floor of Michigan um, and they used a, a recent paper by 
taxonomists who worked with this, this group, it looks like now uh, when we look at what we've got, we've actually got five species of stachys. And so I've included all five of those species here rather than three. All right, uh, and then here's the glossary. I've added some more things to that, just kind of building on it from previous workshops. I've added some diagrams for inflorescence types. Again, Racine and, and Spike will be a couple we'll be talking about somewhat tonight. Um, the shape of fused corollas or the shapes for fused calyces. Uh, so the calyx or corolla when it's fused, here are some terms that describe the shapes. We'll, we'll use that in particular in describing the shape of the, of the calyx. And I use the term cylindrical rather than tubular. Uh, they would mean the same thing. This little diagram again points out what actinomorphic versus zygomorphic means. And then there's a, some whole bunch of uh, terms in through here. Again, I won't take time to go through all of these, but some of the new ones here are actually, um, you know, again, that pertain to Lamiaceae would include uh, actinomorphic, bilabiate, the gynobasic style, which I've already explained, um, pedosol, racine, spike, vertisol, and zygomorphic, for example. So again, just adding some, some more terms that are gonna come up when you look at the uh, pictorial key. So that's, again, the other uh, parts of what you've got in the um, handout. Now, before we go back to the PowerPoint and look at the pictorial key, I'm going to, again, show you a quick video uh, that shows you how pollination works in salvia. Salvia has kind of a unique uh, pollination mechanism where the insect basically is, is probing for nectar, again, basic again, the structure of those uh, stamens and that, that connective I talked about, uh, the, um, the connective that has the um, sterile, basically the sterile anthers, uh, that one actually protrudes down into the corolla tube and the insect actually pushes on that as it's in there for nectar. And by pushing on that, there's a lever mechanism, pushing on that causes the, the other, um, part of the stamen that has the fertile anther on it, it causes it to come down, causes it to come down and touch the back of the pollinator. So we're going to take a quick look at uh, just a real short um, video that shows that. And I, I didn't turn the sound on here, so you're not going to hear any sound, but that's okay because this, the narrator is not speaking English. So we wouldn't, you wouldn't understand them anyway here. So uh, let's see. Here we go. I'm going to I'll start this and then enlarge it for you. Just talking about pollination in general here. Here's salvia. See those come down there? Comes in, probes. They come down and touch the back of the, in, of the in, in, insect. Lever action. I'm gonna show you how this works here. Pollen there. Yeah, remember that happens first, and then after that happens, then the stamens wither away, and now the stigmas mature, and again are going to hopefully brush up against an insect that has collected some pollen. All right. All right, back to PowerPoint. And now we've got about 25 minutes or so to um, take a look at the key. 
So again, this is a pictorial. I don't have a key for you because again, it would have been immense to try to put a key together for all of these all of these things. So it's um, it's, it's not a there's not a, a written key like I have in the past. The the written keys in the past again have been keys for just a genus, but we're we're talking about twelve genera here. And so that table again is supposed to help you figure out perhaps which genus you have. And then if you, if you and, and in some cases again you can you can pretty well recognize which genus you have. A lot of the mints. The genera are pretty distinctive, and it doesn't take too much practice, you know, to give a to a, to develop a good good, good gestalt, and and you know have a memory of what those uh, genera look like. Then it's always you no know, more difficult, usually, uh, to figure out once you know what the genus is, or think you know what the genus is. Of course, to figure out which species you've got, and that's where this um, key comes in. So this first one here is for Agastache, as you can see, the uh, giant hyssops. And um, so it's gonna split the three into two groups here based upon the calyx lobes. Again, you can see how much pubescence or, or not, no pubescence, you know, glabrous over here, leading to the yellow and purple, pubescent over here. Uh, and these over here, the um, blue giant hyssop, those, um, Calyx lobes are kind of unusual because they are colorful. They they have a they have a color similar to the corollas. I'm gonna see if I can get my oops, get my pointer here. For some reason it's not showing up down here. Oh, shoot. Oh, no, oh, maybe it will. There we go. <clears throat> Oop, don't want that. All right. So, and then there's another important difference here is just the leaves. So, vegetatively, you can recognize the, the um, blue giant hyssop too. Again, remember, this is the one that's uh, more of it, it is an endangered species, but the bottom surface of the leaves is really uh, whitened due to really dense pubescence. Tomentose means really short, dense, almost like a carpet, short, dense hairs. So that one separates off pretty easily. And again, if you have the flowers, all of these are gonna be somewhat distinctive just based on the flower color. If we go over here to, again, these two, yellow giant is by far the most common one, um, Agastache nepotoides. And you can separate it from Scrofularia folia on the basis of these characteristics right here. Flower color <laughs> will do it. But if you didn't have the flowers, again, you could look at lower leaf pubescence um, yellow giant is going to have more pubescence over the entire surface of that lower leaf. And the other one is just mainly on the veins, as you can see there. So here's uh, some pictures of yellow giant hyssop, Agastache nepotoides again. And here's some pictures of Agastache scrofularia folia, purple giant. You can see here, I've tried to put uh, some ventral surfaces of, of the leaves here, um, both um, again, purple and yellow over here. There are some differences, a little bit of difference in the stem in terms of pubescence. Um, but, you know, heck, if you've got flowers, and in some of these, in some cases in the mints, you know, it really does help a lot to have the flowers. You might need those. But not for the pycnanthenums. Um, the, the flowers really won't help you much at all here. The flowers on the pycnanthenums are all pretty much the same, uh, all look very much the same. And so these are separated, these three species are separated totally by vegetative and, and totally by, pretty much totally by the, the stems. There are some differences in leaves. So uh, hairy mountain mint, pycnanthemum pilosum uh, separates off from the other two here on the basis of. Pubescence on the stem is just everywhere. Densely pubescent on the angles, that would be the corners, and on the sides. They also have larger leaves. Uh, the leaf blades are, are wider than, uh, than either Slender or Virginia. Uh, so again, this one is pretty easy to separate uh, on the basis of just the stems and the leaves. Your other two that are more similar, Slender Mountain Mint and Virginia Mountain Mint, again, you're gonna look at the stems again here. Uh, slender mountain mint is going to have glabrous completely. I mean, there might be just a few sparse little hairs on the corners, on the angles, but 
pretty much the entire stem is glabrous versus Virginia mountain mint's gonna have pubescence just on the angles. And there is somewhat of a difference in, in the width of the leaves too. The blades here are somewhat more narrow and linear than the blades here. So again, on um, slender, this is uh, Pycnanthemum uh, teniofolium. Got a picture of the stem down here more narrow leaves. And here's a few pictures of Virginia. And this shows up really nice. You can see the pubescence there on these stems. It's just on the corners, not really any pubescence on the sides. They're all gonna have, well, they all have, of course, a nice um, minty smell. The pycnathums have a really great smell. In fact, that smell often persists even on vouchers and fills the her herbarium uh, cat cabinets and shelves where the mints are stored. Um, I think there's just a, there is a slight bit of a difference between the smells, but uh, I mean, you have to really smell a lot of them, I think, to, to get that kind of um, smell in um, me memorized. Okay, so here's three genera that there's just, I only have one species, there's only one species included. So we're not trying to separate these, you know, from other species in the same genus, although uh, there are other species in all three of these, but again, they're just not very common, and so I didn't include them here. So I just threw these three together because they all have two stamens. And so you might end up again, they're going to look a lot different though, uh, but um, in, in, in some ways, morphologically, at least looking at the flowers, uh, they are united at least by that. And so you can see the first separation here is going to be based on the inflorescences, um, blophilia, and salvia over here are going to have inflorescences more terminal. And uh, hedioma, which is pictured right here, has the inflorescences more axillary. So again, has all in. And when we talk about these axillary inflorescences, again, sort of technically what we mean is that there, there needs to be flowers in the axils of true leaves. But these, these are true functioning leaves right up and down the stem here. And then the axles of those leaves, there's flowers. Not a whole lot in, in this species. Um, I think, you know, maybe two or three at least, something like that. These are the calyxes of um, rough penny royal here after everything's mature and, and the fruits are ready to be dispersed. Again, the calyx is really persistent. You can see here that there's a lot of, of uh, sort of short and stout pubescence uh, that is covered. That covers the sepals here, bristly um, in some ways. So rough penny roll is a pretty easy one to distinguish. It's a really short plant, pretty small plant. It would be found in fairly dry and, and somewhat um, low fertility kind type types of places, prairies for the most part, um, bluffs, rocky places. To separate uh, hairy wood mint, lophilia and Rocky Mountain Sage salvia, uh, we're going to use the inflorescences here. So in hairy wood mint, we're going to, let's go ahead and pull that one up. You can see that the, I'm kind of going to describe these as dense axillary vertisols. At least uh, it appears that way because there are some that come down into the realm down here where there are actual leaves. But as you get up towards the terminal, these vertisols become more head-like because again, the, what happens here is the inner node between these nodes where these vertisols are becomes very, very short. And it almost, again, becomes, I, I, I kind of describe these as a compacted vertisols that again, kind of present themselves as sort of a compact head. And we're gonna use that characteristic that I showed you again, the connective between the anthers, um, very, very short in Harry Woodman and most other Lamiaceae, but in the salvias, that connective again is very slender and elongate, and again, is a part of the lever mechanism that we just saw on that video. Uh, the number of uh, flowers per nodes, um, well, five or less here, uh, on salvia, and here's what salvia looks like. There's just a lot more openness. And, and again, spikes, and really, they're not really so much axillary vertices. They're really presented more as a spike or a seam. 
with six or more nodes. So much more open, you know, a lot more space between the flowers here uh, than what you see here, of course. And, and the leaves are very different. And they grow in very different places too. Uh, hairy wood mint is a forest species, uh, only really in the southeastern, um, well, the eastern half of Iowa. They do come into central Iowa. There's, there's some records in uh, Story in Polk County, uh, but mainly it's a eastern Iowa species. And salvia is a southwestern Iowa species. Then same thing with mentha, physostegia, and tucrium. Again, those are three genera that I'm only, you know, only talking about one species. There's only one native species for all three of these. So there is only one. Uh, but then again, they group together nicely because they all have four stamens. And so we're going to separate, uh, again, um, physostegia, the obedient plant out here on the, on the whether the stamens are exerted or not. These are not exerted. We talked about what that means. Uh, both mentha and tucrium have stamens that are strongly exerted. So uh, again, you have to look at this when they're mature as well <clears throat> to, to actually see that because uh, if it's, the flower is not mature, they may not be all the way out yet. Uh, Physostegia, the obedient plant, again, is really, again, uh, pretty easy to plant to recognize, again, by gestalt, uh, these really um, dense, probably um, spikes, or racemes with very, very short pedicels. The flowers are very short uh, flower stems. It's also a very glabrous plant too. And you know, most of the mints, other mints, uh, there's some pubescence usually someplace on, on the plants. This one's got pretty glabrous stems and, and leaves as well. To separate out marshmint and, and American germander, well, again, those two are just vastly different in terms of what they look like. Uh, there's this is marsh mint, so it's got all of these verticels. It's a really good example of what we mean when we talk about axillary ver verticels. Um, large numbers of flowers all um, clustered together at a single node in the axils of these leaves. The corolla, um, and this is a little bit different because most of the corollas and most of the mints are zygomorphic. Almost, you no. Know, again, not not 100%, but um, at least in the Iowa species, uh, I think this might be, well, at least of the ones we're looking at, the 12 genera we're looking at, I think this is the only one that has actinomorphic corollas. Uh, all the other species are zy zygomorphic. And American germander has this very uh, unique characteristic, again, American germander can be very difficult to recognize vegetatively and separate from, uh, for example, species of stachys. But when it's in flower, um, it's very, very easy. Uh, it's gonna again have more of these terminal uh, type of, of a racine. And here's a picture or side view of a flower. It really doesn't have an upper lip. The upper lip would be right here. The upper lip is supposed to go above and protect and conceal the stamens here. But there is no, there is none. Uh, this is the lower lip right down through here and it's got five lobes. So apparently, again, all five lobes of this fused corolla, all five of them contribute to the lower lip. That's why there is not an upper lip. Again, I'll refer you to, again, the reference table, you know, for information about where these species grow and what their habitats are. <clears throat> That's what that table's for. All right, Lycopus. This is um, one of the more difficult groups, definitely, uh, in the mints. They, um, there's, a lot, there's quite a bit of variation in, in these species, and so that, you know, makes things a little bit harder. Um, th but there are some good characteristics, and so we're going to there's four of them and all four of them are represented here. They're all, all wetland types of species. Uh, we're gonna separate them into two groups, as you can see here, based on the calyx. So you really, for the most part, you're gonna need to have flowers. Uh, I, I've identified these vegetatively. One, one of them, uh, American bugleweed, you can do without flowers because the leaves are very distinctive. Um, but the other three leaves are pretty similar. 
I've, I've kind of separated them out vegetatively, but I've done it by looking at examples that I knew uh, what they were and comparing the leaves with, with those known, known ones. But if you have the flowers and you can use the calyx and you can see there's some differences here uh, in the, just the length of the calyx, the size of it, uh, shorter over here, much longer over here. And with that, that plays into what these other characteristics are. Over here then with the, the two with the really short calyx, their calyx lobes are pretty short. They're kind of just broadly triangular. And the tips of those calyx lobes, um, you, you can see some right down in here, the tips of those calyx lobes are, you know, they're, they're kind of rounded or I described this as bluntly acute. They come to a point, but they're it's more of a blunt point. And if you do have mature fruits, the nutlets, because the calyx lobes, the whole calyx is so small and short, the nutlets are going to um, become larger as they mature. They're going to extend above and beyond the calyx tube at maturity. That's opposed to over here, the calyx lobes are, the whole calyx is longer up to 4.5 millimeters. The, the lobes are more narrowly triangular because of that. The apices are more sharply acute. And because those lobes stick up farther, the nutlets are shorter. The top of the nutlets are below the top of the calyx tube. So both of these species we're going to see here are uh, on, on this side first, these two over here. So the first one you see here is northern Lycopus uniflorus. <clears throat> here down here, you can kind of see again some mature, pretty, pretty close to mature fruits here. And um, you, you know, on your, on your PDF, you're, you, you can blow this up on, on, on the computer. You can make it larger so you can look at those more closely, which would be helpful, but you can see that the uh, the calyx is just you know really short compared to those nutlets which are filling the interior here. Also mentioned that like a uh, that like uniflorus uh, northern bugleweed, uh, I've identified it this way too. If you are just vegetatively, you can reach down and feel down into the um, underground portions of the plant there, and it has these tubers uh, that are pretty easy to find. So the other one then is uh, Virginia bugleweed right here. And again, same kind of thing. The, you, and then what you're looking at here basically is you, you're not gonna be able to see much of the calyx. When you're looking at mature fruits, you're pretty much just seeing the fruits because the, the calyx is so small, the, the lobes, um, the tips of those lobes again, don't really uh, emerge uh, really much and, you, and are sort of hidden by these fruits. There's also a difference in the, um, among the lycopus in the number of uh, lobes on both the um, calyx and corollas. So Northern bugleweed you can see have five lobed corollas and calyxes and Virginia here has four. And the other two, uh, American and rough also have four. So we'll look at those two next here. And so here's what I was saying about American. American bugleweed has very deeply lobed leaves, especially towards the base of the leaf. Out towards the apex of the leaf, you, you might call these short lobes. You might call them out here almost like a single tooth because it's so small, but very clearly towards the base of the leaf or the mid part of the leaf towards the base, those, those are lobes, those are not teeth. And here again, you can see how the calyx lobes protrude way above the tops of those fruits there. And that's again, um, American bugleweed, Lycopus americanus, and here's rough bugleweed, Lycopus asper. If you look at these leaves, there are some differences in these leaves, going back to these leaves over here. Uh, and so I, I think, I mean, you can sort of get an idea vegetatively. Um, asper also has some, uh, tuberous enlargements on the root system, a little bit more of an elongate uh, tuber here. That could be helpful. And just to fill up this space, here's some empty space. Well, let's just throw in a picture of what these nutlets actually look like. 
Uh, the nutlets are pretty similar for the most part, but here's what the nutlets look like if you were to pull those fruits out of uh, northern bugleweed. All right, we've got about five minutes left. Let's see if we can finish up here. So the next one here is going to be um, Menarda. Again, there's three species of looking at two of them. These are real simple. Uh, the the Everyone I'm sure has probably seen wild bergamot, uh, so you probably don't need much help with that. This is the other Monarda that is you know, somewhat common. We would find this on sand prairies, uh, dotted horse mint. Very, very distinctive here. Again, these are, they look like leaves, but they're actually floral bracts. So they, and, and floral bracts typically do have some color associated with them. So, um, but again, we, you can kind of call these um, because they're more compacted sort of compacted vertisols. Uh, again, because these are not true technical leaves, they're not green and photosynthetic, again, um, that lends again to the idea that, well, if you have to have true green leaves in order for it to be a vertisol, then we have to call this something else. And so some, some places you see the term pseudo vertisol uh, used to, to describe that. The Corollas are very distinctive on Monarda punctata. But you, you need to be in a sand prairie, basically, uh, for the most part, to, to find this species. And there's our uh, common wild bergamot over here. You definitely can see over here, of course, in wild bergamot, and that's one thing that's being discussed up here in the key here, if I were to go through that with you, that here you see all of the flowers are basically at the top. So the inflorescence consists just of one or maybe at most two terminal flower clusters. Again, this idea of a pseudo vertisol, because again, we could just say, well, what's happening there is just a whole bunch of vertisols are just tightly compacted together. That's what makes it look like this. But, but they're so tightly compacted together here, much more so than they are over here. You can see some space between these. All right, there's some pictures of the stems, pictures of the leaves, pictures of the calices down here and fruit. All right, Scutellaria. Um, Scutellaria, this is the skull caps. You remember we had, um, we're gonna look at uh, four species, I believe it was, yeah, four species. So, I'm just checking my other table here. Yeah, four species. So we're going to put those into two groups, conveniently into two groups based upon the inflorescences. Whether the inflorescences are mainly axillary and or terminal racemes. So the, the, the fluorescence is a raceme, but where does the raceme occur? Are the racemes in the axils of leaves or they could be at the terminal part of a shoot? Either place, that's what this is describing, that the inflorescences are racemes, but they could be in these two different places. Versus over here, the inflorescences are axillary. Uh, again, there are basically few flowered vertisols. The, 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 the inflorescences really are just in the axils of those leaves. So let's look at this group first again. And so we're gonna separate out blue skull cap, uh, which is uh, Scutellaria lateriflora from Hartley skull cap, Scutellaria ovata, on the basis of, well, are those racemes axillary? Are they in the axils of leaves? That's blue skull cap. Or are those racemes more or less at the end of the plant, the top of the plant? So that's what we see here with Scutellaria ovata, a forest species. And the leaves are really characteristic here too, as far as the Scutellarias go. Another thing, um, and this is in that table that shows the 12 genera that, um, separate, that would help you separate out this genus, Scutellaria, from the other genera is shown right here. The calyx on Scutellarias have this transverse sort of projection coming off the top of the calyx. You can see it very nicely right there, and you're going to see it very nicely. Oh, oh, the other thing I forgot, almost got to tell you. So the other thing we see here is the corolla tubes are nearly straight, not S-shaped for blue, whereas they are noticeably S-shaped for heart leaf. So let me go back up 
back out. So this is the Crolla tube and that S shape that they're talking about is that right there. Here's blue skull cap and here's the Crolla tube and here is a straight line because the Crolla tube is basically straight. It doesn't have that S shape. Basically what happens here is just slightly above the calyx there tends to be a slight curve in the Crolla tube very slight, and then up towards the top of the crawler tube, the, the lower lip is what forms this curve here. Here again is that, pro, that transverse projection coming off the top of the calyx. In um, Floor of Missouri by Julian Steiermark, he, he would refer to uh, this kind of form or shape on the uh, calyces of scutellaria as sort of looking like a tractor seat. I think that's basically, if you're looking down at the top of it, have sort of a, a dorsal view of it, it does sort of resemble a, a tractor seat because of the space you'd sit right in right here and then the sort of the backrest right there. Okay, the, the other two, uh, we take a look at them. Again, they're gonna be separated right here. Small skull cap, scularia parvula. Um, well, actually you're gonna see the blue skull cap comes out here and here. You had, had to make it come out both places. The, mo the main thing we need to separate is, is scutellaria uh, galareculata from pargula. And we're gonna do that um, small skull cap just on the size of the leaves for the most part. And the fact that the leaf margins are entire, no teeth and, and more skull cap is, is again, a much different habitat, wet habitat, small skull, small skull caps in dry, dry places, right? Dry, dry Prairie, for example. But again, in a key, you have to use diagnostic characteristics to, to do that. And so that's what works here. Um, Mars skull cap has much larger leaves, two to 10 centimeters long versus these, and the leaves have tooth margins. So that's what's going to be coming up on the next uh, slide here. Here's small skull cap. There's those leaves that, that have entire margins. This again is a very uh, small, short plant. And here's pictures of Scutellaria galareculata, marsh skull cap. Again, you can see the S shape right there. Both of these have an S shape. It's, it's maybe a little more strongly uh, exhibited here in, in this one. All right, the last one, and we're a little bit over, but I'll go through these quick. These are this is stakies, the hedge nettles, and these are the five species again that are present in Iowa based upon the floor of Michigan. Going to separate them into, and these are pretty much all for the most part by vegetative characteristics. A really important thing for these is you, you have to be able to look at the stems and, and see what kind of pubescence it has because this that's the first thing that separates them here. This is kind of like the mountain mints in a sense. So this first one is saying the, the stem internodes are pubescent on the sides and the angles, basically all around the stem and the calyx is pubescent all over it. These three over here, the stem internodes are glabrous, don't have any hairs, or if they are pubescent, it's really just on the angles, just on those corners. There are really not any pubescence on the sides. And the calyx is pubescent primarily just on the nerves and the margins, rather than being pubescent all over the place. So let's look at these two. They're the first ones up here, uh, marsh hedge nettle, uh, which is um, in your guide here. Uh, that one's Stichys pilosa. And then hairy hedge nettle is essentially a new species for Iowa based upon the, um, again, the work that has, has, has separated these species out. Um, it's uh, Stichys arincola. So again, based on the pubescence, uh, pilosa, pubescence of stem angles and sides, mostly spreading. And that's what this picture is showing here, the stem. And by spreading means that the pubescence mostly just, you know, it comes out sort of straight. There might be some hairs that kind of just come out straight. There might be some that kind of go up a little bit, some that go down a little bit, but basically just spreading as those hairs come, come off of the, uh, the surface of, of, of the stem. Hairy hedge nettle, this one right here, arincula, 
uh, the pubescence on the stems, both the angles and the sides, is retrorse. That means it's pointing downwards. It's clearly, the, the hairs are clearly bending and going downwards. And I think you can see that pretty well. I, I put in two stems here from two different sources that basically show, show that. All right, then the, uh, well, the last three, we're going to use the petioles of the leaves, as you can see here, to pull off rough hedge nettle, stickies aspera. The main stem leaves sessile to very short, the petioles less than eight millimeters. The other two here have um, longer petioles. There's uh, maybe some difference in the width of the leaves. Then to separate out these two, you can see here that we're gonna basically use pubescence on the uh, petioles and leaf blades. The, uh, the hispid hedge nettle is named because of the hispid pubescence that has stiff, bristly, stout hairs, uh, mostly present on the petioles and, and the leaf blades. The petioles are somewhat shorter here versus these down here, smooth hedge nettle. You'll see in the pictures that, that uh, there's quite a bit of difference between them. So the next three pictures then are these three, uh, the next slide, the last slide. It's hard to find good pictures of rough hedge nettle. This is the best I could do, which isn't much, but if you look really closely at the at this stem and blow it up, you can see that the um, pubescence is just on the corners here. And again, this one is supposed to have um, the leaves are sessile to very short petalate. And that's pretty much what these leaves look like here. It looks like these are sessile. There's not much of a leaf stem there at all. So that fits pretty well. Here's the hispid one. Look at these um, hairs again, mainly on the corners. Again, that's what got us here. Hairs on the corners of the stems, not really on the sides, just on the corners. And here's some of the, the pubescence on the leaf and petiole, that hispid hairiness, and also that this is a short petiole compared to smooth hedge nettle over here, where the, there, there's just a lot less hairiness on these stems. So that's another good characteristic. It doesn't really come out in the key, but you can see a big difference in these two stems here. And smooth, and again, smooth hedge nettle has petioles that are longer and leaves that are more uh, elongate and more lance-shaped than, than these leaves here. So that's it. Um, ran over a little bit, but a lot of mints to look at here. So that's what I've got. If there's time, we'll take a few questions, maybe five minutes or so. But. Yep, we got a couple in the chat. Um, let's see. I'll just keep Leland this up. Leland asked uh, other taxa have bilateral symmetry. Okay. Other uh, other, other taxa have bilateral symmetry, such as. Sure. Yeah, the uh, Scrofulariaceae, um, Plantagenaceae, lots of other families will have have that same type of flower symmetry. So it's yeah. So that's not that's definitely not um, you know diagnostic for the mints. There's many many flat families that have have that. Orchids, to name just a few families. Um, and then Leland was also asking about um, the introduced catnip. Uh, how do you? Well, so I didn't include. Yeah, I didn't include catnip in here because it's not native. Um, yeah, yeah, it is introduced. It's um, it's not too much of an invasive species, in my opinion. I mean, I don't really see it that much in natural areas. Um, occasionally, certainly, but I've never really seen it as at the to the extent that I would say it's you know a big problem. But but it is another mint. Uh, again, as I said, we've got thirty three percent, or yeah, thirty three percent. I think it was. 34% of our mints, mints are non-native. So there's, it's actually a quite high number. Can't include everything in, in, in the a family in, uh, workshop, especially if to try and stay yeah. within an hour. 
Um, what has happened to Stakey's lustrous March Marsh hedge nettle? Is not is it not found in Iowa no. or is it? Yeah. So <laughs> so um, I I won't take time to do this, but if you pull up your reference table, you will see that. Um, the second to the last stakies, I'm looking at it right here on this other computer and, and I won't take time to pull it up here, but on the handout I gave you, stakies palustris was recognized, you know, that's been the stakies that we've seen and was the common stakies in Iowa. There were actually three varieties recognized by others in Rosa, Pilosa, Homotricia, and Phanaropoda. Stakies um, palustris, variety of Pilosa is what has become stakies Pilosa. But Seki's palustris, that, that species all by itself is, is now uh, recognized as being not native to North America. There are populations, it's a European species. There are um, European populations of Seki's, a true Seki's palustris in the New England states. I think uh, floor of Michigan recognizes that they might have a population or two in Michigan. And, I, and I, I believe maybe if you look at Bone App, it, it might say that there is a site in Iowa, but I'm not sure that's correct. Uh, so yeah, that was an overhaul of the taxonomy of stakies that was done um, and published in this paper again. And it was the basis for the, the revision of stakies that is was well, present in flora of Michigan and, and at least part of it's also present in the flora of, of, of Missouri. In both of those floras, Stachys palustris is now recognized as a European species. Okay, that's what happens when they. That's what happens when they start looking at DNA and and um, into the, the the real genetics uh, of these populations and species. All right. The final question is. Mehania, I don't know how to say that. Cordata native. Mehania. Invite me again. Me. What? What? What's? What's it say again? Uh, Mehania cordata. Not sure what they're talking about. Uh, I could try to look at the chat. I guess I. I can uh, stop my sharing. Mehans mint. Uh, okay, it looks I'm looking like at, it's more of a I'm looking at the chat, but I don't see it. Maybe I can't. Maybe I can't move the. I can't scroll through the chat though. I guess. What can you spell it? Uh, M e e h a n i a. Cordata. Not a mint that I know of or ever heard of. Uh, it sounds. I'm guessing it's non-native or something. Um, but yeah, I'm, okay. I'm not. That sounds like a common name. I, I'm guessing it's a common name for a mint and. Uh, it doesn't, I, I, I've not heard of it. So it's, I'm guessing it's not native to Iowa, I suppose. Okay. There are lots well, of mints that are got for now. Uh, So yeah, I mean, uh, Physostegias yeah. have been planted in gardens. Agastachi has been planted in gardens. Uh, so the mints are also, are also complicated by the fact that many of the native species have been transferred into the world of cultivars and when that happens, then that, and, and some of the mint, mentas as well, of course. And so when that happens, you know, you get hybridization happens more and you get cultivars, you know, then that get perhaps escape from cultivation and get out in nature and become naturalized and things just get messy. Uh, I wish they wouldn't do that, but some of them are too beautiful, I guess, to resist the temptation to bring them into the, the home flower garden. All right, well, uh, next week you get to listen to uh, um, Chris talk about winter twig identification. And I will be back in two weeks uh, doing Carex. Is that right, Lance? Yeah, Carex. Yep. Yep, thanks everybody. Thanks, Tom. See everybody. Bye. Stay warm. You too. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.